Usually I like to ask what people remember from the last message, but my last message was just a few minutes ago. <laughs> if you forgot to write it in your Bible, write the surest proof of, God love, of God's love for you is the discipline and correction he gives you. Don't ever forget that. Now, for this second session, I like to read again our scripture verse. I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore I have drawn you with loving kindness. In this second session, we will think about loving God. You know, he loved us so much, so how much do we love him? Some years ago, I was visiting a holy pilgrimage site somewhere in Asia. People will come and they will take baths in the holy waters, it's on the ocean, and they will bring offerings, and you see all kinds of people sitting uh, on the beach and worshiping. And I noticed one man sitting there. He was sitting in a yoga position, and he was all twisted up with his hands, kind of, and his legs, and he was sitting totally silent and he was staring into the rising sun. The sun was just coming up and I was asking the missionary that was with us, what is he doing? And he was explaining to me, he's a sun worshiper Looking into the sun is his way of worship. Now, I watched, you know, the man didn't move even when the sun was shining in its full strength. He still stared in the, in the sunlight. And I said, uh, he's going to damage his eyes, looking like this into the bright light. And the missionary was saying, yes, he will. And he also will eventually go blind. But this is his devotion and his sacrifice to his God. Think about it. I ask myself to be willing to sacrifice my eyesight. And then I ask myself, what has this son God done for this man compared to what Jesus has done for me. You know, God poured all his love on us in Jesus. He redeemed us from hell. He forgave our sin. He broke our bondage. Our names are in the book of life. We will be forever with the Lord. I think when God poured out his love on Calvary, he was waiting for us to love him back. He had given everything. Deuteronomy 11, one says, you shall therefore love the Lord your God and always keep his charge. So we know we're supposed to love God. But how do we love him? This sun worshiper, he's staring into the open sun. But what do we do? How do we love him? Well, we go to church Sunday morning and probably every Wednesday night. We pray and we sing and read the Bible every day. We may teach Sunday school, serve on the worship team, we give our tithes, our offering, 
each time the collection plate comes along. And we go on a mission trip to Mexico and Russia, and we collect clothes for an orphanage somewhere in Haiti. And we do face painting when the VBS comes around. And we help save the whales, you know, in the ocean and the redwood trees in California. And we help with rescuing the polar bears in Alaska. And every Christmas, we ring the bell for the Salvation Army in front of Macy's. Is this not what God is asking us for and looking for when we say we love him? I mean, what else could he want from us? Isn't that about everything we can do? Now, there is a book out, and I don't know, I imagine most of you have looked at it. It's called The Five Languages of Love. Anyone has seen that one? It says that everybody has their own love language, specific things that spells love for you. It may be different from what I think love is, but it says some people like gifts, you know, getting flowers and chocolates, and some like acts of service that someone does the dishes for them that will say, I love you, or words of encouragement, kind of some cheerleading, and others like a hug or two or three. They like touch that tells them, you love me and quality time, spending time with you without the cell phone and without any distraction. So everybody has something that spells love for you. Now, often we try to love someone else with what love means to us, you know, but the person we do the nice thing for he doesn't feel loved. Have you ever seen, I'm sure you did, some TV show, Coach? It's an old one, you know. But this husband wants to love his wife. And he does the nicest thing he can think of, what love means for him. And he takes his wife on a fishing trip out in the wilderness <laughs> and the wife is the most miserable person on that whole trip <laughs> and then his wife tries to love her husband who is a football coach and she buys him cards to go to the ballet with him her and he's there you know watching this ballet and he, he's totally bored, you know. We try to do something for others that we think is love because we like it. My nephew, when he was growing up, he liked to check out all these DVDs, you know, and watch it one day. His 80-year-old grandmother was saying, why you don't let me watch something too. Why you don't go and pick up some nice animal movie for me? And she thought about something cute and cuddly and fuzzy. And he goes and checks out Jurassic Park for grandma. <laughs> she almost got a heart attack. That book says we first need to find out what spells love for the other person before we head out the door and try to do something nice and they don't understand it. Now, this is very true when it comes to God as well. We should first find out what God interprets as loving him before we go on a loving God, to, we make a loving God to-do list like we did in the beginning. 
Now God says something very specific, what loving him is all about. What exactly does the Bible tell us what God considers loving him? Okay, Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, it says, loving him is to love him with all our heart. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. So loving him means I need to love him with all my being, spirit, soul, and body. No piece of my heart can be missing. What else does consider God as loving him? Loving him is to love him above all else, above everything and everyone in this world, including our own lives. You read that in Matthew 10, 37, 38. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Another very specific thing what God considers loving him is to love him to the point of choosing the cross. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me, Luke 9, 23. And then what else does God consider loving him? To love him to the point of obedience to his word. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, John 14, 23. Loving him is also to walk and to live according to his word. And this is love that we walk according to his commandment, Second John 6. In John 14, 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Now, doesn't that sound different than running off and teaching and Buddha offering and all these things which are all good things? This is what God says, if you want to love me, this is how I understand love. And then there are other things. Loving him is loving others as ourselves. If anyone says I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar, First John 4.20. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also, First John 4.21. And then, of course, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. One more thing, what loving is to God. Loving him is to love one another as he loved us to the point of giving our lives for others. John 15, 12, verse 14, love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. Now, Jesus was talking about the commandments he gave to us. What are they? Well, Jesus confirmed the Old Testament commandment. You shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And then he said, those who love me, the proof is if you keep my words, if you keep the things the Father gave me. Now, what is that word that the Father gave him? 
Well, Jesus said, I didn't speak nothing out of my own initiative. Everything that I spoke, I got from the Father to pass it on to you. John 14, 24, the words which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Now, that means actually, if we love him and we keep his commandments, it's actually everything we find in the New Testament and everything we find in the Old Testament because even all the words in the Old Testament is belong to Jesus because he is the living word and this is the written word and they are both the same. So loving God actually suddenly looks much different than a loving God to-do list. I do this Monday, I do this Tuesday, I do this Friday. So we look now what God means by loving him. And he expects us that we love him back in the manner that spells love for him. Now the Pharisees had maybe a 800 or 1,000 page to-do list and Jesus didn't consider what they were performing that it was loving God. We need to love God in the way he understands and he specifies what loving him is. Now I think when we look at the verses that we read, we will come to the conclusion. God expects us to love him back with the same love that Jesus has for the Father. That is the highest level of love in the whole universe. Jesus was loving the Father with everything he is, with the highest level of love. It's the divine love that we can only find in God himself. Jesus loved the Father with the divine love that was in him. And now the Father is looking at us and he wants us to love him also with this highest level of love. And I think when we take a good look at ourselves, we must say, you know, we try our best to love him in return, but this level of love God expects from us to give him is beyond our capacity. It's beyond us to love God in such a way. And Peter, the Apostle Peter, he recognized the same limits in his capacity to love God. You know, he had betrayed the Lord Jesus three times. Just right after he had promised that he was ready to die with him. Now after the resurrection, you know, he had this one-on-one -on -one conversation with the Lord Jesus in John 21, we read that. And I think Peter was rather uncomfortable. You know, he wasn't so sure. Well, Jesus probably loves the other disciples. But what about me? And then, will he still want me to be an apostle? Now, before... Jesus answered any of these things. He asked Peter three times, do you love me? And Jesus used the word, do you love me, with divine love. He used that two times. Peter, do you love me with divine love? And Peter kept answering him, you know that I love you but he was using not divine love, but the term for friendship love. Jesus asked for this level of love, and Peter says, I love you with that level of love. 
the human love. Now, did Peter misunderstand the question? I don't think so. But I think he had come to the conclusion that he need to be truthful with the Lord Jesus about his capacity to love. What he answered was actually telling Jesus, you ask me if I love you with the divine love that is in you. I don't have that love. That love is not in me. I am only capable of my limited human love. And with that limited human love, I love you. That's all Peter could say, and he was very truthful. All the love, all the human love that is in me, I love you with that, and you know how faulty it is. Does God ask Peter and us for something that's impossible for us? Not really. Jesus is well aware of the limits of our human love toward him. And that's why he decided to give us his divine love as a gift so we could love him back in the way he asked us to love him. So how can we receive this divine love in our hearts? That we can love God in the way he wants us to love him. Now, we know from the example of Peter and the other apostles, we cannot get it by our own strengths. Peter tried that, you know. I'm this macho guy, and he failed miserably. We cannot get it also by making a decision from today on, I love God just like Jesus loved the Father. The decision is not enough. So how do we get it? Well, the good news is when we receive Jesus, God's love came to live in us. You remember? 1 John 4.16 says, God is love. That means when Jesus came, love came into our heart because love is not a feeling, love is a person. God is love, that his nature, his name. So when Jesus came, divine love, the divine love moved into our hearts to indwell us forever. He is there. Love is a person. Second Corinthians 4, 7 says, but we have this treasure, that means Christ, in earthen vessels. So, we have this divine love living in us. And then the second thing is, God said he poured out his love, his divine love, into our hearts. Romans 5, 5. The love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So when we received Jesus, not only came the person, Jesus, love, into us to live there, but also through the Holy Spirit, the divine love of God has been poured into our hearts. And then a third option, not option, a third truth. Love, that divine love, that we cannot fabricate ourselves is a fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit came to live in us, and he is producing fruit. It says, Galatians 5, 22, 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So 
the fruit of the spirit is love. So we got the divine love actually three ways. God put it into us so we can love him back as we ought to. Now, the fruit of the spirit, how do we get this fruit? You know, we are a Christian for a year or two or three. When do we have this fruit? When is it ripe? Well, actually, fruit production goes automatically. If you have a tree, spring comes, leaves come on the tree, the blossom comes, and by fall there will be apples or pears or something. The fruit is automatically. If the life that is in the roots and the trunk goes up to the branches, then the tree doesn't have to do anything. The fruit will automatically grow from a small blossom and then you got the big apple. Jesus said the same thing. Fruit production in your life is automatically, if you stay connected to the vine, which is Christ, and Christ's life will flow through you. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing, John 15, 5. So Jesus is the vine, and we are the little branch, and we will automatically produce fruit if the life of Christ flows through us. Now, God's goal is that our fruit production will increase. A young apple tree, the first year, it has some apples. There may be five apples all together. The following year, we may get 10 apples. And if that tree is maybe 10 or 15 years old, we will get a basket full, two baskets full, the whole apple tree will be full of apples. That means the longer we know Jesus, we can love God more and more, every day a little more, because the fruit of the Spirit is love, and it's supposed to increase continually. Now, Peter and the other apostles, they experienced that in their life. You know, from running away and betraying Jesus, their love for Christ was totally transformed. They received this divine love after the Holy Spirit came. You know, they fearlessly proclaimed the gospel. And they were willing to suffer whatever persecution came in their life. And they loved Jesus enough to die as martyrs. So what about us? Our love for the Lord is supposed to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And if you are 20 years old Christian, your love should be way greater than the first day you receive Christ. Because Christ's love will flow through you and produce that love fruit.
we have in many different parts of Asia, we have churches where we have first generation believers and they come out of great darkness and they love the Lord with all their heart. Sometimes I think we have come to know about God's love for so long. Uh, it doesn't mean as much to us than when we look at these first generation believers. I want to tell you about some of them. A few years ago, a small church in one of the villages in interior Myanmar, which is former Burma, these believers had received Christ and they built themselves a little church building and they came together to worship and then persecution started. And they were harassed by the villagers and uh, they demolished their church and beaten up and all these things happened. And the villagers were hoping to get them back to their old faith. But the believers faithfully stayed faithful to the Lord. And then the village leader, he announced, we give you a final ultimatum. Forsake Christ or leave the village forever. Now, these villagers were so sure that these Christians will surely deny Christ because who will want to leave everything they have? Everything, their houses, their lands, everything. And so he was determining that to make sure these believers not just faking it, they need to sign an agreement of homage or worship the monks they had there. So they were very smart. They got one believer after another, not as a group, and they asked them to sign that agreement that they will return to their old faith. And they were lying to them, telling them, you know, all the other Christians that we called in our office, uh, they all signed the agreement. Why you don't sign it too? And each believer decided by himself, even if everyone denies him, I will not. And none of them signed. And they only found out afterwards, none of them had signed. Now, among these people was a young woman. She already had paid a very high price for her obedience and love for Christ. When she got saved, her husband gave her the choice. Return to your old faith or leave. You cannot be my wife. And she didn't give up Jesus, so he divorced her and he chased her out along with her small little baby girl in her arm. Now the day of the ultimatum came and all 16 Christians they joyfully walked away from their village with just a few belongings on their back. They left behind their homes, their land, their farm animals, their possessions in order to be obedient to the Lord Jesus and to love him more than the whole world. And among them was this young sister with her little baby in her arm. She too walked away, never to return. For the sake of Jesus, she and the others had lost everything in, her, in their life. This young woman said, my only hope and prayer is that one day, my daughter, when she grows up, she will go to Bible college and then she will return 
to my village as a missionary and tell them about the wonderful love of God and his grace. And she said, I'm eagerly looking for that day. So what about us? To what extent do we love God? Do we love him with all our heart? Or is a piece of our heart missing? Do we love him to the point of obedience to his word? Do we love him to the point of picking up the cross and following him? You know, we have been given the capacity to love him back. He made it possible. He put this divine love in us. So why then do we lack in our love for God? Why do we lack in our love for God? Actually, lack of love for God is directly related to our relationship to Jesus. It's a problem of abiding in Jesus. There is not enough of the life of Jesus that is flowing through us. After 20 years, our apple tree only produces three apples a year. Something is really, really, really wrong. So how did our branches lose their connection with the vine? Well, the Bible tells us sin separates me from the life that is in the vine. Isaiah 59, 2 says, but your iniquities made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you. For a believer, if we sin, if we confess, then he forgives us all our sins and cleanses us from all our unrighteousness. But if we don't bring it to the Lord, don't make it right, then there is a disconnection between me as a branch and the life of Christ that flows from the tree. Maybe only two or three drops of life is getting through but not a steady stream that can produce that fruit of love. And then the second thing, why we lose the connection to the wine is our attraction to the world. It robs us of our love for God. And I think maybe this is in our 21st century Western Christianity, maybe the biggest reason why our love for God is not growing. John 2 verse 15, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It's very serious, dear sisters. If you love the world or the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in you and you are not able to love God back in the way the Bible says we ought to love him. And then the third thing that loses the connection between the vine and the branch is the lack of God's word in our life. It causes our branch to starve and wither. Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4, men shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Dear sisters, are you in the word of God every day? 
if you are not, if you make shortcuts, then your little branch is starving to death, it's withering. And you cannot produce that love that you need in order to love God adequately. And then the last thing, not taking time to know him, not about him, but to know him, hinders his love to develop in your heart. You know, Jesus prayed before he went to the cross, and there is one sentence that tells about the relationship we has, he has with the Father and what he wants for us as well. And that is in John 17, 26. He says, and I have made thy name known to them and will make it known that the love wherewith do you love me may be in them and I in them. He talks about the love relationship he has with the Father. The Father knows him and he knows the Father. And he wants that to be in us and with us as well, that close. If we don't take time to know him, there is not enough love that develops in us. What do we need to do to remove these hindrances that separates the branch from the wine? We need to look at each of the things I mentioned and find out which one is hindering you, which one is hindering me. Examine the love you have for the Lord. You need to look very carefully. Are you growing in your love for the Lord or are you standing still or are you loving him less today than you loved him five years ago? Do you have this abiding in the wine problem? Dear sisters, think very seriously. To what extent do you love the Lord? Be really, really honest. Peter was honest and said, this is where I am. And Lord, you want me to be here, but I can't. When we look in God's word, God never put the brakes on his love for us. He poured it all out on Calvary. And he desires for you and I to love him back likewise. That we pour all our love we have on him. Love him back freely. Shall we pray together? Before we pray, if there is something in your life you need to remove that God's love will flow through you and that you can love God back, please make this decision today, maybe right now. I will remove that hindrance that doesn't allow me to love God as I ought to. If there is sin that separates you from the vine or your attraction to the world or your lack of God's word or that you don't take time to know him, please identify that in your life and remove that hindrance so God can receive from you the love he deserves. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, we look at our hearts and we find us lacking in love for you. We try to love you with things that you don't ask for. 
Lord, we want to love you in the way you put in your word what means love to you. So many of our branches don't have enough life flowing through them. Lord Jesus, we don't want to walk out of this building without making it right, without changing. We ask you to give us the grace to remove these hindrances that your love, your life will flow through us. Lord, we desire to love you. And we ask us, we ask you to give us your grace that we will come to you this morning and like Peter say, Lord, I can't do it. And then you will fill us. You will forgive us. You will cleanse us. You will fill us with your love. And we will be able to love you back freely. We pray this in Jesus' name.